Thank you for joining us for another quick tip talking about extended treatment of venous thromboembolism. My name is Craig Beavers. I'm an assistant adjunct professor for the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. The learning objective and disclosure to this presentation are similar to the other quick tips, and that's to select the best anticoagulant for the treatment and extended phase management of venous thromboembolism, including optimal drug dose and duration. And there's nothing disclosed related to this presentation. As we discussed in the other previous quick temp with initial management, you want to determine the phase of care, know your options, and consider the four Ps. In this phase of venothromboembolism management, we're talking about the treatment to the extended phase, and that's from the end of initiation phase after 21 days to the first three to six months, and then after that six months, determining if patients uh, need a phase or treatment beyond the six-month period. The anticoagulation options for this phase or these phases of treatment from the FDA perspective include the direct acting oral anticoagulants, and those are preferred due to non-inferiority with efficacy less bleeding and more convenience, the vitamin K antagonists, low microwave heparin, and fondoparinox. If you look at a high level of the treatment guidelines, the chest guidelines for starting points they do have other recommendations, but just from a starting point, these are some of the recommendations. In patients with acute VTE who do not have contraindications, we recommend a three-month treatment phase of anticoagulation. In patients with VTE diagnosed in the absence of a transient provocation or an unprovoked VTE or provoked by persistent factors, they recommend offering extended phase, meaning beyond that three-month period, with a direct-acting oral anticoagulant. Likewise, ASH suggests indefinite antithrombotic thrombotic therapy provoked by a chronic risk factor, and they also suggest indefinite antithrombotic thrombotic therapy for patients with unprovoked VTE over stopping therapy if there's a low risk of bleeding. Like we discussed in the initial phase, there is the four Ps for treatment and extended phase VTE selection. And in this instance, instead of patient presentation, the first P is patient provocation. Likewise, we also look at patient characteristics, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and then patient adherence. With patient provocation, you really want to look at, as we alluded when we talked about the guideline side, is the VTE provoked or unprovoked? And if so, were there major, minor, or risk factors that are persistent that would mean that it would put them at a higher risk. And obviously, if it's a provoked with major, consistent, persistent risk factors, you may want to consider extended therapy. Clearly, if it's unprovoked uh, in that instance, the patient would probably warrant uh, indefinite anticoagulation. This algorithm really helps outline what are some tools or considerations to think about shorter versus longer course anticoagulation. So if they have a DVT or a PE, you can start out asking, does the patient have act, an active cancer diagnosis? And if yes, is it catheter-based uh, or associated VTE? If that answer is yes, you do a minimum of three months. If it's not, you look at maybe a minimum of six months of anticoagulation and potentially longer. If they do not have an active cancer diagnosis, you look and say, is this provoked by a transient risk factor? If so, you can say, well, we'll do the three months of anticoagulation. If not, you would ask yourself, does this patient have a history of VTE? If the answer is yes, extended or possibly lifelong therapy is warranted. If no, you would ask yourself, does the patient have a high risk of bleeding and consider that patient characteristic? And if yes, you would do the minimum of three months. But if they're not at high risk of bleeding, consider extending that therapy long-term. Again, you would also wanna look at patient characteristics in terms of what your preferred agent is. You, know, you can potentially look if they have a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and you're worried about bridging them with something, you could use DOAC. Again, we referred to cancer previously and you could really look at using DOAC as an agent of choice, especially if they don't have gastrointestinal cancer on a high level standpoint. If they have liver disease, you can consider low microwave heparin. Again, we talked about with dyspepsia and GI bleeding, using a Pixaban or VKA, given that there is not risk of increased bleeding or concern of ulceration with those agents. If you're talking about pregnancy or pregnancy risk or breastfeeding, a low microwave heparin is agent of choice. Uh, renal dysfunction and stage one through three DOAX can be used, and then VKA considered in more severe renal function. Antiphospholipid syndrome, VKA can be uh, selected or should be selected at this time. 
Uh, obesity, as we said, ISHLT has released updated statements and guidance that proves or suggests that DOACs are safe in any degree of weight fluctuation, especially obesity. And then obviously with bleeding, in a lot of instances, DOACs may be preferred if the patient is going to be on therapy and it's safe to do so. The next P is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, like we discussed in the initial phase management. You really want to consider uh, the patient's drug, drug, food, and herbal interactions. Again, referring to the CYP3, 4 inhibitors, inducers with DOACs, uh, thinking about all the variety of food indications or interactions that can occur with uh, warfarin or BKA agents in the herbal interactions. And the reason I bring this slide up again in this phase is you have to really, especially when you think about extended phase, consider how their medication therapies are gonna change or any dose adjustments that could occur that can impact these therapies. Con always considering and constantly evaluating their renal function or looking for dysfunction and how that changes the dose and impacts the, the patient. And if there are any adjustments, reduce bleeding. We'll talk about bleeding risk in the next slide. You wanna look at liver dysfunction. And then obviously if there are anything that could potentially impede or impair absorption. When looking at long-term factors or risk for bleeding, you really wanna consider the, these items to sway you for or against extending therapy if, if you're looking at uh, bleeding risk. And that's, are they on antiplatelet therapy such as dual antiplatelet therapy or aspirin? And is that something that can be modified? Did they have recent bleeding? And if so, where was it? And how was it managed? And is it stable? Do they have chronic or anemia that we need to address or adjust or figure out where that is occurring? Do they have long-term cancer? Are they of older age and do they have renal disease? And all these things need to be evaluated in context to determine uh, their risk of bleeding. And then the last P is patient adherence. And like we talked about in the initial BK, VTE quick tip, you want to consider if you have to deal with injections uh, or if you have to rebridge them, avoiding um, the bigotrain and doxaban or warfarin and sticking with the Pixaban or rivaroxaban. If cost is truly a concern for whatever reason, warfarin is still an option. If you're looking at once daily dosing, you know, in this phase, rivaroxaban is once daily. You can look at adoxaban or warfarin. If you're looking for monitoring adherence checks, warfarin is an ideal option. And then dose timing without regarding to mills. So, in conclusion, guidelines recommend DOACs in general as the agent of choice. However, the four P's should guide selection. That's patient. Uh, in this instance, provocation. So what is provocating the DVT? What are the other patient characteristics? Pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and patient adherence. Thank you.